everybody, this is Mike, and you're watching The Real Black Podcast. And today with me is a very good friend of mine, uh, Mr. Jawan Zakobi. Almost stuttered and forgot my name. <laughs> huh? Almost stuttered and forgot my name. Your own name? Yeah. So you well, did, it's right yeah. here on the CD. Well, you, that's, you had to look at it and find out my name was? You said a good friend of mine, then you couldn't even remember my name. I thought you were stuttering. All right, never mind. I, I just want to make sure the CD was here ready. Jawan Zakobi, jazz composer. Okay. What, what do you think about that? How, how do you, how does it feel to have a CD out there on the market with your face and your name on it? I'm not out there. Well, it's a necessary thing, but it's not a comfortable thing for me to put my face out there. It's not that's not my ideal situation, but I understand the reasons why I'm doing it. Okay. If, if I could, I'd have an artist rendition or some other, a different picture up there. But um, from a marketing aspect, this is the reason why my face is on it at this point. You're humble. Well, I don't know about that. Well, you're, you're, now you're on the Real Black <laughs> Podcast, so you're, you're completely exposed. Uh, Let me just put that right there. Put up higher? Okay, they can see it, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, they can see it. And we're here. All right, yeah. So, I mean, tell us, <clears throat> tell us about, this is your second release. Yes, it is. On J. Kobe Music. Mm -hmm. uh, no, J.K.M. J.K.M. Mm -hmm. Which is a record label. Okay. So, uh, tell us about this one, which just came out. Uh, this one came out in end of February, February 26, early March, and I was telling you it was doing pretty well up. It's um, it peaked at number 24 in Jazz Week jazz charts. Um, I have a single. I released four singles that didn't go at the same time I released this, and the singles are at number one and number two respectively on SmoothJazz.com and some other radio stations and stuff like that. So fantastic. So for an independent person without money behind him, big backing from a company, I'm pretty I'm pretty happy with the um, results of some of the things I've done because I'm a one man one man operation where I'm doing marketing, writing, everything. You know, I need help. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but not but not without the, pedigree. I mean <laughs> I need I need some help. You know <laughs> can't do it alone. To quote James Brown or Bobby Bird Bobby Bird. Now you, and you shouldn't. And you, and if you have a ch if you have a chance, you shouldn't do it alone. Well, let's let's get into that then. What I mean, I know. I mean, this has been your dream. To mm -hmm. I mean, for years. When I first met you, you were not actively. I was a scepter. I was working in scepter. Okay. And I was working. I was doing music. I was still doing music behind the scenes. I was doing. Um, I prior to meeting you, I did the Best Western commercial. I was still doing tunes and, and submitting them tunes and trying to make you know. I did a TV pilot in Chicago. Didn't make it any place, but I was still. I've always been writing. I'll, I'll always write, regardless. You hear what, hear about what I'm doing or what I'm not. I'm always going to be writing. Okay. Doing something. But the but the choice to take a nine to five primarily was. I had I developed a, I, I developed a habit, and um, it was called eating. And I just wanted, you know, I just want to break that habit, so uh, I had to get a job to support my habit. Okay. Then I had a family and everything family, like that too. Kids through school. Oh yeah. <laughs> But I, I remember the day you left SEPTA, which is which for those who are not in Philadelphia, it's the Southern Eastern Transportation. The Southeastern Transportation Authority. Okay. Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority. But you weren't the friendly bus driver. No, no, I was in management. Okay. I worked. You know, SEPTA is broken down into two things. Well, three things: administration, transportation, and maintenance. I worked in the maintenance department. Okay. So anything electrical or anything like that, any electrical vehicles I worked on or managed those departments. Okay, yeah. so, so sort of like Barry Gordy when he was working at the auto he, plant. He actually worked on a line. He was actually a mechanic. I mean, I started as a mechanic. I mean, electrical mechanic and, and set up, but then I went on to, um, to management. But Barry, he was, he was pretty much on a line all the time. Okay, so so we we could theoretically say you're like the Barry Gordy of Wilmington, Delaware. That's a real stretch, but <laughs> <laughs> well, you got your own record label. Man, you know, easy to get a record label. <laughs> Humble, <laughs> humble. Well, the record label is again a mercantile. You got a business license, and I'm I'm an LLC. Plus, a, I'm gonna have a business license. That's, well, talk, and talk, that's, people, that's, talk and people. That's my record label. So it's a legitimate, it's talk, a legitimate business. Talk people through it, because I know this this was your goal once you once you left SEPTA, was to put your own releases out and get them played on the radio. So. Yeah, and well, first, to tell the truth, the first release I released while I was at SEPTA. The first, and I was still at SEPTA, and um, so they came out doing it. SEPTA, I was recording time at SEPTA, and I released it the, the next to the last year before I retired. And this is the one I completely did without, you know, away from, after, in total retirement. Okay. So what are the challenges of doing this? 
it's, it's funny. When I worked at SEPTA, it seemed like I had, I was wondering, it seemed like I had to, I mean, I, I was focused. I could get the things done. After I retired, it took me five years to get this thing done. I mean, I couldn't, I, like my focus was all over the place. And I don't know what, I had to all the time in the world and couldn't get stuff done. But um, it was it was fun, I mean, after a while, because I had to choose between how many tunes I was going to put on which tunes and which arrangements. And um, I have 29 people on this particular CD. Wow. That, that contribute to this. So I recorded here in, in this area, then I recorded some stuff in Boston and Cambridge area. So, I mean, musicians I knew up there, so it was a... Right. Yeah, well, talk about that. I mean, you, your pedigree is the Berkeley School of Music. Mm -hmm. Berkeley College of Music, Berkeley yes. College of Music. Mm -hmm. In Boston. Right. So, <clears throat> so, I mean, well, speak to that. I mean, you know, I, I'm sort of in this... We have similar path in the sense that... Um, we trained very much when we were younger, but now with the technology and all those things, we're able to get our, more work out. Yes, and it's fu it's funny too. You mentioned that because years ago, when I graduated from college, um, of course we know they didn't have computers. What well, they had computers, but I mean, it, it was they weren't totally absent, but they weren't like personal computers. They didn't have the they were basically mainframes or something like that. And so when I came to you, had to, you, there was nothing but you had to write your, your music out in notation. I mean, was, there was nothing else out there that you could do it. Now you have um, all this notation software, and even my my skills have diminished by using the notation software um, over the time. But so that was a difference because I always wanted to fancy myself like Beethoven. Beethoven used to, I mean, because you would write your melodies under a tree, you know. Which, what else could he do? He couldn't record. He couldn't call up on his answer machine and right. sing into it or something like that. So I was trying, I was wanted to get that proficient in writing, and that's what I aimed for, being able to notate like you write words. Um, but like I said, because of all the um, advantages of technology, you have Sibelius, you have Finale. These are notation softwares that a lot of people use. Um, there, there are others out there, so, too. So what do, so I could, I could put a record out. Almost. If I could hum a melody, I could put a song together. Is that what you're saying? I'm sure you could. You find somebody who wants to put the rest of it to it. Okay. An arranger. <laughs> yeah, an arranger. Yeah. Okay. Well, you could. Do, I mean, but then, I mean, for yourself, for the argument sake, yeah, they have enough pre-recorded things that you can splice together and make a song. Garage band. Yeah, the garage bands and other stuff. So you can you can make something. Right. But so what's what? what's your creative process then? Like how, like like a song, like Compliments and Shoes, how does that come come about? Compliments and Shoes is actually on my first CD. I never released it until this one. Okay. <laughs> it's recorded. Then I, re I didn't like the way it sounded. Then I took another band and, and, and did it. How that came about, it it was just, um, well, I'll tell you, the title, Compliments and Shoes, is, it's really taken from a Chris Rock routine. Okay. It's watching the home box. I'm like, oh, Chris Rock cracks me up. And uh, he said, the only thing you know, women need, all they need is compliments and shoes. Just men, just give them compliments and shoes. Of course, he said some other things I'm not going to say in the podcast. And that stuck out with me, and I thought that was a really catchy title. So I called the tune Compliments and Shoes off of a Chris Rock routine. And that's an instrumental, and um, I did it with a, some, some, some really fine fusion musicians, Vic Stevens, Andy uh, Lalasis on bass. And just me, we and I put all these things together. Um, it sounds like a larger ensemble than it is, but that's how that particular tune came about. Then you have Doc Gibbs. I forgot Doc Gibbs is playing percussion. In fact, Doc gets, Dibbs, Gibbs did his percussion in 2012, and we're still using the same exact tracks that he did, even though I'm using a different band on this than the original band that he played his tracks to. If that makes sense to you. That makes sense. Okay. That makes sense. But I mean, in terms of like how a song comes to you, what's what's the process? People ask me that, and I said, I just sit down at the piano and see where my fingers go. Mm. You know, and said, you said, oh, that chord sounds like that voice and sounds good, or this, you know, something like that. It's not a, like, let me sit. I mean, you, I do sometimes, when I'm given a job, I do have to sit down and say, somebody says, I need a tune by tomorrow. Yeah, you, I have enough in my arsenal that I can come up with something, you know, by tomorrow. So I can write under pressure, but for this type of thing, just sit down, play the finger. Oh, this is where the melody goes. It doesn't go. And then you think you have it. You think you have it finished. And a month later, no, I don't like that. Let me change this around. And let me. So you keep tweaking it and massaging it until you get to a point. Either so, you, you, so like a painter. Yeah, I guess you guess. Yeah, it would be. Yeah, we're artists. Same thing as an art. Anybody writing, art, paint, whatever. Artists do this. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I and you have to get to a point where you have to actually let it go. And that's that's my hard part. <laughs> <laughs> Get the when am I gonna stop tweaking this? And then you gotta say like, oh, this, this is it. Right. So tell, tell me about one of the newer songs then that's on the album. 
on the album itself? No, it's, that's not from 2012. Oh, from not from 2012. Um, well, basically, well, we have Contagious. That's the first one. Um, I guess you got, you got a bad young trumpet about on that album, Liam Jordan Jr. I mean, he, I like playing with him. The boy is bad. Yeah, Cal Hughes Buddy. That was that, I named that. After, that was for my granddaughter. My granddaughter and I. Um, I I'm, I'm a, that's that's my kryptonite. But we used to watch these cartoons. We still watch cartoons together and shows. And it was a little boy from. It was a Canadian cartoon, and his name is Cal Yu. Cal Yu, and he's four years old. And we used to watch this all together. And so that's why I call Cal Yu's buddy. She's Cal Yu's buddy or something like that. So that's how I named it. Came my little child. And, it's named after my grandchild again, <laughs> you know. It was after it was what I mean. It was the title was inspired by my grandchild. It's really inspired by a Chick Corea tune, but that was that was the impetus. That's cool. Well, yes. Let's speak speak about some of your um, inspirations coming coming up in jazz. Like you know, we're, we're playing a little bit of it now, but um, you know, for those who are just discovering you, Joanza. Like, what? Are, who were some of your influences before you started to make your own music? I have I have specific people, but I, but generally I use it's everybody who was before me, or everybody who's with me, right? Who's every person who came before me influenced me. Everyone who's on the scene right now influences me, and I'm sure I'm going to be influenced by people in the future. So, um, those are my influences. So, what made you in? What made you interested in becoming? A jazz composer. My thing has always been. I mean, I, I, you, you like to perform, but my thing has always been behind the scenes. I was always the type of person like, who arranged that? Who wrote that? How did this, you know, get? I was always picking up album covers and seeing. Like I said, I knew who Holland Dozier and Holland was, and they were just as big to me as the Temptations, Four Tops, Supremes, and everything like that. Or um, Norman Whitfield, the other, the Paul Reiser. It's like Paul Reiser's arranger. See, people, I mean, th those are the people, Paul Rising Arrangements, and I mean, and who else used to arrange it? So, um, another prominent arranger. For David Van Der Peet. I don't remember, from Motown, Ed Motown? Motown, he was all, the other arranger on those, um, on what's going on. Oh, man, okay, yeah, so that, those, I'm, I'm, I didn't know, I'm, I knew, I know O.B. Benson and Marlon Gaye wrote the tune. But, um, yeah, I was always behind the scenes, things like, that's why I was enamored with the Beatles, um, because George Martin, uh, behind the thing, especially when you hear El. Eleanor Rigby. That was that was an that was. I mean, right now we're hearing the tunes we've heard it so often. He probably it doesn't sound like thing. At the time it came out, it was revolutionary. It was a, nothing but a string quartet playing percussively. That was keeping the beat, and that was really revolutionary. Nothing else had sounded like that. Mm. Of course, Quincy Jones. Oh man, Quincy Jones is Quincy Jones is a hell of a arranger. I mean, and he's the one. He's the reason I that got me really interested in going to Berkeley and amongst other people. My influences. Are, they range from, I, I mean, I have so many influences. Like my my father turned me on to Oscar Peterson when I was seven, and I was hooked. Then I got hooked to my brother. He was, um, he was he, my older brother. He was into classical music, and I didn't listen to class. I didn't listen to anything other than classical until Duke. There was a uh, Gene Chandler came out with Duke of Earl back in 1962. That's when I switched over. Mm. Then the four times became my Beatles <laughs> and. But as, as far as arrangement, like I said, I mean, Oscar Peterson, I mean, Ramsey Lewis and pianists, and all that, because the music that I gravitated towards in the early, in the 60s and stuff was music that was accessible. Eddie Harris, you know, electric, you know, listen here, and anything that was accessible, mm -hmm. I pretty much went to. Then as my ear developed, I got into, because I wasn't able to get into our tape. I wouldn't have known what the hell he was doing until I had to be talked about how he was doing. Bud Powell, Chick Corea. Now, her, I mean, the, her, the, chick, the Herbie Hancock tunes I knew was a watermelon. I didn't know this, like, intricate stuff. And that stuff is, ooh, Herbie, Herbie my idol. But I can go on a lot of about the idols and people I like. Because it's not just in jazz. My, my, my interests are, they're in different categories, too. Right. Well, I mean, when, when, I walked, when I went to the studio to see you recording some of this, I was really impressed with not only your insistence that your players play exactly what you wrote, but just the technical virtuosity of all the players that you chose to work with. Oh, yeah. Can you speak a little to that? I've been fortunate. Um, they always say, get somebody better than you, and that's the way you learn. So that's not hard to find anybody better than me, but I mean, in music or something like that. Uh, but these, I'm, I've been fortunate to, to associate with musicians who are, I mean, 
the 29, I mean, the people, but then some of the people on this CD, I mean, they're legends. You have um, Bill Pierce. Bill Pierce was the head of the woodwind department at Berklee College of Music for over 20, 30 years. Also the music director for Art Blakely and the Jazz Messengers. Who brought, and Bill Pierce brought in um, Winton and Brad from Marcellus, Terrence Blanchard, Kevin Eubanks to, to the Jazz Messengers and stuff like that. So he's on the scene. Bill played with my first big band concert back in, um, he was a teacher, but I had a, I, even though he was a teacher, I was a student, I had a big band con, um, con I had a big band um, at Berkeley. And Bill graced us with his presence um, as a guest star. You got Doc Gibbs on here, Doc Gibbs percussionist. I mean, Doc, who hasn't Doc Gibbs had some play? He's an Emerald Lagasse's band um, on, the Fox, on the Food Channel. That was, and plus he's um, recorded with Al Jarreau, Bob James. I mean, the list is ridiculous. I'm trying to think of some other people. You got Lee Smith um, on bass. I believe he's a legend in Philadelphia, but his son is doing more, his son is the, the more um, well-known as Christian McBride. So I'm fortunate enough to have, I mean, I, have, I can go on a lot of list of other people, I know we only have a few minutes, but I'm fortunate to surround myself with musicians who, who want to play, who, who, who like to play with me, who find my music is interesting enough to keep them interested and to bring their A game to the table. Fantastic, fantastic. So what, what do you hope people take away from Jazz Composer? I know there are very few uh, physical copies left, but where can people hear it and what do you want people to take from it? I, I like original. I, I, I would like to. I, um, how can I say that? I just hope they come by and feel good about it. That's the whole yeah. thing. Well, yeah, it's definitely that's, the kind that's of. Only, that's the basic thing. How do you feel I, I can attest. This is great music to listen to when you're at work or driving the car. What I and, and what I and even my do all my thick CDs. I I like being able to put a CD on and saying like. Maybe it's maybe it's one artist, but the music sounds so different. You you actually sound like you're changing the station in between things. So you're actually listening to a different state. Because when, in Philadelphia, it was a station. I, it was on AM. Now, I used to listen to DAS, WDAS, WHA2. We grew up. These were the black stations and the soul station. Yeah, of course, I listened to them. But my favorite station was WIBG. Mm. That was on AM. Now, people don't know that because WIBG would play this and that. Where, you know, WFIL... They played pretty much pop music exclusively. WHAT, WDAS, you would never hear the things, you wouldn't hear a lot of those tunes on WDAS and WHAT that you would hear on IBG or FIL, like, you know, James Brown's tunes. I mean, other other groups that you would never hear um, unless you listen to WDAS or WHAT. That's where I got my, you know, my, my funk and all my stuff from. But WIBG, I like played in a, 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 a mix of certain things. You know, they didn't play the extreme um, soul t hits that they played on H.A.T. and W.D.S., but they played some of them, and they played some of the other stuff. So I kind of like that as getting a mixture of tunes. That was my favorite station in Philadelphia. Fantastic. So where can people find this? Um, it's on every plate you can find this, any place you find any other artists and stuff. <laughs> and iTunes, iHeart, um, what the other places? YouTube, where you, um, for buying and stuff, for downloading, Spotify. Just Google my, if you ever Google my name, um, quite a few pages come up, so you can find it in any place there, in any place. Now, the actual physical CDs, um, because things are changing in the music industry, um, CDs, as we're told, are not selling as well as um, they used to, so things are going to digital downloading, so you can download my CD, you can download this from all those other platforms. Like I said, if you just Google my name, we'll come to my website, you'll see the links and stuff like that. But the physical product is the physical sold out right now. At the right at this point in time, the physical product sold out. I'm giving um, I'm going to do my first major uh, performance in September um, 17th at the City Winery in Philadelphia. City Winery has a is a chain of um, performance venues, uh, uh, restaurants, pretty much on the east east of Mississippi. I would say that um, where major stars come through. So I'm happy to be a part of that that um, that um, family. These performing there. And I'm, the reason I brought that because I may make it a CD release party, so I may be having some CDs to sell there. Okay. I decided, but there you can go to see. There's some CDs at CD Baby. You can buy. You can actually buy physical CDs at CD Baby at this point in time. Okay. They fantastic. have a limited amount right there. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, I can't wait. So, what's the date at City Winery once again? The City Winery date is September 17th, Friday, 
September 17th, City Winery in Philadelphia. It's three days before my birthday, Chief. It is? Yeah. Oh, well, you should tell oh, Let me change the date and make it on your birthday, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let me call them up, man. <laughs> I'll, I'll make every effort to be there. Okay. And last week, last year, I took you out for your birthday for breakfast. You did? That? that was, yeah, that, that was, was that you was, were getting your car. You were getting your car. You said, it's my birthday. Yeah, I was just moving in, yeah. Well, okay. Yeah, I was just moving down here. So I plan these things. He doesn't know that. <laughs> no, no, I've known you. I've known you. It seems like forever. Oh yeah. And I'm so proud of you. Oh, uh, getting this done. Proud of you. Stuff and, you do. Uh, and you know, for those who don't know, uh, Juwanza did a lot of the music in the early days of Real Black TV when we when we had interviews. We also had music underneath under the bed. So um, this is like a full circle moment for us. So, <laughs> so uh, th thanks again. Oh, okay. For hanging out. And uh, again, Jawaza Kobe, jazz composer. And then the first one is called? Uh, feels Better Than It Sounds. Yeah, so both those are available. Those are still, they're still, they're, now they're available. <laughs> I got quite a few of them. Wanna, just give me, want, want a record? Call me up. <laughs> I can sell it to you. Come to City Winery if you're in Philly. Hi, this is Jawaza Kobe, and you're watching Real Black. Film scoring is a really intense, um, uh, uh, an intense endeavor or an int intense thing to do from my aspect, from the way I do it. I also, film, I also do things for TV. And what happens when you get, once you get the score, like some people, they read things, they read it from the script. I, I'm not a person who can visualize things from scripts too well. You have to actually give me the finished film um, where you want the dialogue and everything like that, and I have to spot the film with the director, as most you know, anybody else does. Let, but when I'm doing film scoring, I'm always I'm immersed in the film. There's nothing else. I have like tunnel vision when I'm doing a film. I have, I'm, I'm I'm all in it emotionally, physically, mentally, everything. Any way I can get into, it, I'm into it, and I don't come out of it until the film is finished. Um, sometimes directors and they don't recognize that. They may think like because when they made a change or something like that, you may think they don't recognize you have other things to do. But this is the only way it works for me. I have to stay in the film. It's like you have to, you're, a, you're an actor, you have to stay in character. And this, I just finished the film up and, um, today. And it was, um, it's called, what is it called? Oh, I'm sorry. It's called 9 p.m. Whistle. It's about the segregation and some of the things that it practices in the South that were going on up until recently about having the little codes they would do to have keep, keep black people off the streets in cities. So this was this particular film is about. Um, and I'd been started working on this in October of last year. I've been immersed in this film and it's when it's kind of challenging because like I said, you stay in character from October until today. Of course, there were some laws and the things that I had to take a break um, to do my CD promotion. That was the only time I took a break from it. But other than that, I'm eating, sleeping, and everything. I'm into that film. And I'm even like, I mean, it's good that I have a studio in my, my house. I can get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and change things around that I was like, I can't sleep because, you know, insomnia or whatever reason, this is what I, this is what I do. TV scores are the same way. TV scores is a lot shorter than films or something like that, but it's, it's, it's the same approach. And like I said, I've always been into behind the scenes, like Earl, Earl Hagen, um, it was a Herschel Gilbert. I mean, ones who worked for Rifleman, all the people who used to write for these TV shows. I used to lay those Schaefer for Mission Impossible. I know these composers because I said, this is what I'm into. I like the arrangements. I like what goes behind it, what, what goes behind the scenes and stuff like that. So this is what I'm really into. Um, but this is what film scoring. I also made some, um, I'm doing an educational thing for my film scoring too. I made some process um, videos or process capturing me what I'm doing and so I plan to release those also for people who want to do who want to learn how I do film scoring and so I have those things that are in the works too but film scoring is a really intense thing I love it but it isn't it is a it's a taxing thing if you have other things going on which most of us do um, one thing with the major film scores that people don't know if they say like a Hans Zimmerman or some of these other people Danny Elfman who are the famous people's out there John John Williams is in a class by himself that's but it usually takes them three months 90 days to do it from the time they see it to the time they deliver um, it's some let's, I mean th that varies but let's say it's used an average of three months or something like that now the reason I say John Williams is different because 
Danny Elfman and Hans Zimmerman, they have a team of people that work with them. And some of the things, you don't know this, but they have a team of people they may orchestrate for them, they may do some of the things and arrangements and stuff like that. He may come up with a theme and they embellish it for him. John Williams is the only that I, he's one of the people, he's still doing the old score. He writes his own stuff, he orchestrates his own instrument. So there's a difference between writing a theme like Danny Elfman, I understand, doesn't read music. So he has to rely on orchestrators to someone to actually bring out his, flush out his ideas and put them in different um, uh, families of instruments and stuff like that. But John Williams is, is class by himself. It's, 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 uh, like the old school um, film goes, he's, he's, he's the guy, he's the real deal. And, uh, but like I said, I, I, I was always in the film score. I mean, from the, from the first time I saw King of Kings and Michelous Rosa's um, score for that, and Elmer Bernstein, and I, I can go on about people in the behind the scenes, but that, that's what I like. Okay, I'll count off for it. All right. <laughs> One, two. One, two, three, four. Hi, I'm Juwan Jacoby, and this is uh, the group. This is a great day for all of us, and especially for me, um, getting together with these people that I haven't played with in years. Hi, this is Terry Thompson. I was playing sax on this, and uh, good friends with Juwan's. We go way back, so it's just a great thing, you know. It's great music, and just getting to play with these guys, listening to it, learning. It's back to school again. Hello, I'm Jackie Beard. Very pleased to be back playing with Jawans and these guys again. And reminiscing over the days when we were students back at Berkeley. I was there from 76 to 80, and these were my family members. My name is Bill Pierce, and actually I was a teacher when I played with these guys. These guys went from being uh, my students to being some of my best friends and some of the people that I uh, cherish, you know, and uh, this is what life is about as far as I'm concerned anyway. I'm Ron Mockdee, the bassist. These folks were part of my development. It was such an important part of my life that this year session actually became almost as important as the time we spent together when uh, we were uh, colleagues at Berkeley. I'm Keith Gibson. I'm the drummer on the session. I had a great time. Came down from Vermont where, well, we don't play that much jazz, but uh, it was great to meet Jawanza and be back with cats that I know. My name is Federico Alanis, and I'm, uh, I guess the highlight of my music career when at school was to be in this 28-piece big band for the final recital with these cats. And to see them again 40 years later doesn't get any better than that. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to get together at this age after being together 40 years and playing together and playing music. And I can't say enough and don't know anything else to say, but thank you. All right, all right, one, two, one, two, three, four.